Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We gather together as God's beloved children, seeking God's presence in our lives, knowing God's call pushes us to live our faith in the world. As we worship today, we have so many opportunities to know God's presence with us, to be renewed, to do God's work in the world, and we take time together to engage that in every way we can. We gather ourselves in this time of worship and praise, and we invite God's presence to be with us. Let us pray. Holy God, as we open ourselves to your word, we lay aside all that hinders us from listening to your voice. We ask that you grant us grace to hear and wisdom to understand and courage to apply what we learn. God, help us hear you speak wisdom into our lives. Amen. I just realized I forgot my bulletins in the front pew, so I'm going to take a quick walk as I introduce myself. I'm Kathy Wiegand, she, her, hers. I serve here as the pastor at Algoma Boulevard United Methodist Church, where all people are truly welcome. We have this opportunity to be reminded of the great commandment. Jesus said, our call is to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, which means we're loving God, we're loving neighbors, but we're doing that also recognizing that we have to figure out how it is that we do love ourselves. It is a challenge, it is part of our call. In addition to welcoming you today, of course, we also welcome our online worship participants. We're always so glad that you're here with us online. It's such a beautiful way for us to all be together, praising God and learning and growing in faith. Uh, as you noticed on your way in this morning, we had an ice cream social going on. That is in part our celebration of 150 years as a congregation. One Sunday a month for the next few months, we'll be having one special Sunday where we have an event and where we share some of our church history, which will lead us up to our 150th, which we celebrate in December of this year. According to the church's 25th anniversary booklet, our church began as a suggestion of Edward L. Payne. It says, Brother Payne and other members of the First Methodist Episcopal Church had often commented on the absence of any house of worship in this part of the city and felt a strong desire to thoroughly cultivate this promising field. And as a beginning, a large tent was secure and located in a grove on Algoma Street. In 1872, Edward Payne and W.P. Stowe, who was the fast pastor at First Methodist Episcopal Church, invited an evangelist to come to town and to lead the people. She was known as that queenly leader of evangelists. This is Na Maggie Newton Van Cott preached in Oshkosh. She had been planning a trip to Fond du Lac to preach that summer and reluctantly added the Oshkosh group to her long journey. She had daily meetings for a while, and they said that it resulted in great good and much religious interest, that many began to live a new life. Many of the people that we talk about in our church history are remembered in our stained glass windows. We see the last names of many of the people, including Maggie Van Cott, who's in the window up there, um, as a reminder of the wisdom and the leadership and the grace and the prayer that went into building this congregation. We know that we have so much because so many people have worked for years to help this be a place of faith for the community. So Mrs. Van Cott was here. She was preaching and teaching, and after she left, there was all this excitement. So they bought this piece of property on the corner of Algoma and James Street, which is now New York Avenue. People quickly began to donate and to pledge money to the project, and they were able to build quickly. It was known as the Methodist Episcopal Church of the Fifth Ward and was dedicated on the first Sunday in December in 1872. 
an article appeared in the Daily Northwestern during the time that she was in Oshkosh preaching, and I think it gives us a sense of that tent revival and what it was that stirred all the people up at that time. The article was entitled, Work for Sinners. Revivalist is in Oshkosh. The lady evangelist commences her series of services at the Algoma Methodist Church. It described kind of how she led and why people were so excited to be part of the service. They said that she interspersed it, uh, the service with hymns and perhaps through her song, the service grabbed people and helped them be connected to it. It said she would be seemingly in the midst of fervent prayer when suddenly rising to her feet, she would rush to the pulpit and in a loud, but by no means unmusical voice, would start up some well-known hymn. As if by magic, the audience would leap to their feet. Magically, the entire church building would tremble with the sacred music. Said that to prevent her remarks from becoming dry, Mrs. Van Cott interspersed them with interesting stories of her experiences in saving persons who were without the fold of Christianity. This is maybe my favorite part of the story of Maggie Van Cott. At the close of the service, she invited all of the Christians in the audience to come forward and to kneel at the altar rail. And then she looked at all of the people who were still left out in the pews, and she invited them to come with her to the parlor so she could talk to them in private. Isn't that terrifying? Is there anyone I need to talk to after worship today? Let me know. She gathered with them in the room, and she prayed with them and talked with them, and she, it says she did her utmost to wean them from the world to the life of a Christian. And when she returned to the auditorium of the church, she announced that the people with whom she had pleaded would try to live a Christian life today, and that tonight she would ask for a report of how they had done during the day. So I expect your written reports on my desk next week, friends. Mrs. Van Cott concluded her services with a song, and after the service, she held an informal reception, shaking the hands of nearly every person present in the church. When questioned about her work, Mrs. Van Cott said that for 25 years, she had been in service to God, and that during this time, 60,000 people had professed Christianity as a result of her efforts. So today, we remember, we give thanks for what must have been a feisty and faithful and passionate person of God who was here, who was changing lives, who was holding people accountable to living faith, and who was doing all that she could to share God's presence in this community. As we think about her impact, as we remember the history and all that we've been given as we live in the life of this church, Let's hold that joy and those stories in our hearts as we sing together. Our opening hymn is in your hymnal. The lyrics will also be on the screens. Number 152, I sing the almighty power of God. Please stand as you are able.
Please be seated. The last line of that song, that God is present there, we trust that God is present with us in this moment, that when we gather together, we know, we experience God with us. We take time each week to be in prayer together, to connect with God, to connect with one another, and to be lifting each other up. For those of you worshiping online with us today, please feel free to share your prayer request in the chat so that we can be praying for you throughout the week. We lift up our joys, our concerns, and we share our prayers. Uh, a joy in the life of the church was time we had together sharing ice cream this morning. Thank you uh, to Don Nelson who made all the homemade good stuff and for Lisa Marie and others who gathered together all of the things. I think there's going to be leftovers, so you need to take some home with you today. Um, a joy for all of the ways we continue to find, to serve in our community, to reach out to kids in the neighborhood, uh, to find new ways to share and love. We ask for prayers today for Kellen Zayner, who continues to work at Lake Lucerne Camp and Retreat Center. She's working at camp during the week, and she's home on the weekends, so we get a chance to hear how it is to work at church camp for the summer. They're still cleaning up lots of mess and lots of trees from the storms that went through some weeks ago, um, and I think she's probably loving every minute of it. We also take time to lift up our worries knowing that we hold each other as we pray together. We've been praying for Wayne, who is now home from the hospital and recovering from a heart procedure. They ended up being stuck in Milwaukee longer than anticipated, uh, but he was here for service today, so we are joyful. Uh, continued prayers uh, today, Andy, for you and your family as you work to plan the memorial service for your mother who passed away. Uh, in the words of the family, she was closer to 109 than to 99. Uh, was it 99 years, 7 months, 15 days? Did I get it right? Yes, a long and brilliant life. Uh, we remember her and we're praying for all of you, especially as family is traveling home. I also heard last night that Craig Bloomer's mother passed away. She had been in decline. Uh, they were able to call and all the adult children were able to get there in time to the Dakotas to all be gathered and to say goodbye to her before she died. Please hold them in your prayers. Also a prayer for our church family, our treasurer Ellie Jackson, who many of us know and is such a treasure to us. Uh, her husband was diagnosed with cancer uh, last week and he began treatment this week. Please be praying for both of them. Uh, the cancer has been found in three different parts of his body, which is so worrisome, uh, especially in someone so young. So please be praying for Ellie, for her husband, for their medical team, and for all of that family. I did forget one uh, other joy, so let me step back for a second. Our church administrator, Deb Nelson, is celebrating one year of being cancer-free, and we celebrate with her, and we lift up our prayers of praise. If you have other joys and concerns, tell me after worship today so we can get them added in for next week. Um, and again, I am happy to hear those before and after worship. We'll do less of the sharing during worship because the people worshiping online can't hear you. Uh, so we're working on figuring out how to do that. Isn't worship weird right now? We're still sorting it out. So um, as we lift up those prayers and the prayers of our hearts, we trust God is with us. We know that we are here for each other. Let us be together in a time of prayer. God, we know you hear our hearts, that you walk with us and experience the joys of our lives, and that you're also with us in the pain and the hurt and the struggle. We're grateful that you continue to call us each day as we live out these lives of faith to grow and to seek wisdom and to live each day in the light of your love. We know that you are the fountain of all wisdom, the life source from whom we learn all that is good and pure, merciful and compassionate. We give you thanks for the example of your son who in all things modeled peacemaking love for others, the wisdom that comes from walking with you. Just as people were drawn to him then, we draw near to you now. We want to know you, to experience your presence in transforming ways so that we can be renewed by your spirit. 
Today we open ourselves to you. Do your holy work in us, healing us, correcting us, comforting us, and encouraging us. Help us, as a result, be the incarnation of your presence in the world. Help us live in the example of Jesus Christ who showed us the way and who taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Let us continue on in a time of prayer as we sing hymn number 451, Be Thou My Vision. You may stand as you are able. Please be seated. As I read the scripture today, I want you to imagine a parent or a mentor who was important in your life, someone who taught you some of the best things that you know. And as I'm reading it, I want you to imagine that parent or that mentor, that teacher, talking to you in the hope that you could learn something about life that they're giving you the best of what they have to offer to save you from some of those mistakes that we just always seem to make in life. Hear these words of wisdom from the book of Proverbs, chapter 4. Listen, children, to a parent's instruction and be attentive so you might gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender, and my mother's favorite, he taught me and he said to me, let your heart hold fast to my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get insight, do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will keep you, love her and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom, and whatever else you get, get insight. Prize her highly, and she will exalt you, she will honor you and embrace, if you embrace her. She will place on your head a fair garland, and she will bestow on you a beautiful crown. Hear, my child, and accept my words, that the years of your life may be many. I've taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in paths of uprightness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered, and if you run, you will not stumble. 
Keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn away from it and pass on. For they cannot sleep unless they've done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they make someone stumble. For they eat the bread of wickedness. They drink the wine of violence. But the path of righteousness is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The way of wickedness is like deep darkness, and they do not know what they stumble over. My child, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them escape from your sight and keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all of their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance. For from it flows the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk from you. Let your eyes look directly before you and your gaze be straight ahead. Keep straight the path of your feet and all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the left or to the right, turning your foot away from all evil. This is ancient wisdom. Proverbs were written a very, very long time ago, and yet so much of it still speaks to us so powerfully today about wisdom and our deep need to listen and learn and grow. We've been reading for the past year Brian McLaren's book, We Make the Road by Walking. And we continue on in that study of the book as we listen together and learn together. We know that the scriptures are filled with so many rules about how we're supposed to live as people of faith. In the Old Testament, we experienced Moses receiving the Ten Commandments, those top 10 most important rules. And then if we get so far as to read into Leviticus, we see rule after rule after rule about how we live together in community, how we live out our faith. We read about all the things we should be doing, all the things we shouldn't be doing, and we know that a bunch of our religious texts are really laying out the rules for us. But then we get to the New Testament, the life and the ministry of Jesus and the Gospels, and we see that he comes along and he starts challenging some of those rules, suggesting that maybe life isn't so black and white, that there are situations where we need to know the rules and understand the rules and think through why it is that they are in place. Jesus even asked people to set aside some of the rules and focus instead on the great commandment to love God with our heart and soul and mind and strength and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Now, I think we could all agree that faith would be so much easier if everything were just black and white and right and wrong, but we live in this world that has been and continues to be so filled with gray. So if we're going to navigate that well and navigate that in faith, we need to grow in wisdom. We need to discern God's path for our lives and how we'll be living each day. So how do we even start? How do we begin down that road? As a parent, I really resonate with the words of the Proverbs that we read today because, you know, as parents, as as teachers, as people who care about kids, we want them to have everything they can, every piece of wisdom and knowledge that we can share so that they can have amazing and beautiful lives. We want the best for them. Our kids, the kids in our communities, the people in our church family, people all over the world, we do truly want to be moving towards wisdom so that together we can share in this beautiful life that we can all live as well as possible. So the conversation begins with God. 
Faith is about growing in knowledge and love of God. And scripture tells us that loving God is absolutely linked with loving our neighbors. And as we're called to love our neighbors, we're also called to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We're not always very good at the loving ourselves part of it. How do we do that? How do we learn to love ourselves so that we're loving God and loving neighbors in the best ways that we can? We know that God loves us so deeply. We know that the Holy Spirit is working in the world in such powerful ways, and we can learn ways that are holy and healthy in how we love ourselves. Of course, there's the challenge of the culture that we live in. We're in very much a consumer-based culture, and sometimes it pushes us to be self-centered, and selfish even. You really have to have this, or your life won't be complete. You really need this. You deserve to have that. But the Spirit of God teaches us a profoundly different way to love ourselves. It's a way of wisdom and maturity that challenges us to really look at our lives. Self-examination, self-control, self-development, and self-giving. These practices, along with God's presence, help us take care of ourselves well. They help us love God and love others more fully and more joyfully. A lot of the struggles that we face in our own lives are often connected to the feelings of entitlement that we have about certain things. We want to have it all. We want to be able to compete with the neighbors or our friends. We want to have all the things we think or we've been told that we should get to have. But sometimes when we seek so completely to find those things and to have those things, it can happen as a expense to other things in our lives. It can actually cause harm to us. And that's when God calls us back in to love. We know that God is present with us as we live out our lives. We see God's presence in Scripture. But when we read through Scripture and see all the laws and the rules and the commandments, God seems kind of like this big, divine killjoy. Don't do this. You better not do that. You're going to have no fun at all, ever. You can't have nice things, and if you want it, I bet it's against the rules. Sometimes we might feel like that's how God is in our lives, but we forget that it is part of God's beautiful and beloved creation that God made us to be people who can experience pleasure. We have taste and smell and sight and sound and touch and so much more, and God has made this amazing world with so much in it we have so many ways we can find pleasure and joy. Eating, touching, music, sports, painting, gardening, dancing, travel. Human pleasure is good and a beautiful part of creation. It mirrors this amazing capacity of enjoyment that exists in God. And scripture shows us that God takes pleasure in creation and in us. And I think it's one of those things that parents and teachers and artists, among others, understand in relationship to their children, their students, and their works of art. There is pleasure in those connections. And scripture reminds us that God has given us things to enjoy. And that in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. So why with all the rules and the warnings in the Bible? At children's time at first service today, we talked to the kids about all the rules we have to follow when we're little. You shouldn't touch the stove. Why? Because it's hot, right? It's dangerous. You probably shouldn't run across the road without paying attention. Why? It's dangerous. There are so many things we have to keep our children from getting into. And, you know, there are certain ages where they're doing it all. And it's 
terrifying. But as our kids grow up and as they learn, we teach them how to cook and how to use a stove. We teach them how to ride a bike safely and how to be around cars in a way that's attentive. We do all that we can to go from the most restrictive of rules when they're little and just need to understand that it's a no and it's not for them to how they can develop into understanding why and how to safely engage some of those things. So when we look to scripture, we see this set of rules that are enormous. But we know that they're designed to keep us safe and to keep us in community in good and healthy ways. And then we look to all of life's great good pleasures. Food and drink and having and winning and resting and playing and working. But any of those things in excess can become addictive or destructive. When we're all about pleasure, all about whatever it is we want, we lose track of our connection with God, with self-examination or self-control. Sometimes our focus on great pleasure can lead to great pain. So how do we find the balance? Those rules do have an important place. Self-control is important. We have to learn and have wisdom around some sense of order about how we can live our lives so that we're not getting stuck in a childish or selfish or self-destructive immaturity. But I think there's such joy in how the Holy Spirit moves in the world. Because we see in scripture, through Jesus and through the work of the Holy Spirit, people looking at the laws and the rules and saying, why was this created? And what does it mean for us? And how do we live it well? The Bible is our starting point. The scripture is always calling us to follow the Spirit, to grow in faith and maturity, and as part of that, to be moving towards wisdom. We move from basic questions, is it right or wrong? Is it legal or illegal? And then we move into questions that are harder to answer, that have more depth. Will this help or hinder? What are the short-term or long-term consequences what are the unintended consequences that we haven't thought through yet? Is there a better way that we could do it? Now? Later? Never? Who could I talk to about this that might have a different perspective? When we find good ways, contemplative ways, to live into those gray areas of life, we have an opportunity to listen for God's leading, to grow in wisdom and in faith. And live well and wisdom helps us sort it all out is it wise to spend so much money on that is it wise to take a shortcut if it might cause issues with people or in business or in your long-term reputation is it wise to send that angry letter if it's going to cause irreparable harm is it wise to overindulge in alcohol or drugs or tobacco or food, those things that could cause harm in our lives. Wisdom guides us to see beyond the immediate pleasures of life to the potential consequences that are less obvious and probably less pleasant. How do we make good choices? How do we have healthy balance? We also see when denying ourselves all pleasure is unwise for those of you who have raised kids do you remember those moments where you were working and parenting and it filled up every moment of every day and the exhaustion that went with all of that it's unwise though for parents to get so exhausted from jobs and the work of parenting that they forget to go on dates or have great conversations or look out for each other. When that happens, they could lose track of the many things that they enjoyed about the other, which helped them create this beautiful life 
together. Again, we have to seek wisdom and balance because wisdom guides us to nurture relationships so that we can make good decisions. Wisdom helps us balance work and life and helps us practice self-care. We need God's wisdom in our lives so that we know what our limits are, so that we can stay in balance when we know when it's time to say yes or no, or to say that's enough, or that's unwise, or now is not the time. We need God's wisdom to know when we need to be asking for help because we're in over our heads. We need God's wisdom to help us monitor the difference between legitimate desires and dangerous temptations. We need God's wisdom to keep different kinds of pleasure in a healthy and sustainable balance. As the teacher in Proverbs wrote, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. That wisdom, that faith, that balance, that's what helps us pour out love for ourselves, for God, and for our neighbors. So as we grow in faith, we pursue wisdom. And when we pursue wisdom, we can often get out of our own way. We learn how to be a friend to ourselves instead of our own worst enemy. We learn self-examination, self-control, self-development, and self-care so that we can do a better job of practicing self-giving toward God and to others. Rules are a good place to start. We add faith and wisdom. We allow the work of the Holy Spirit to be present in our lives, and we seek to understand that the goal is always to love. So maybe that's central to how we live each day. Maybe that's central to how we choose and pray and live. Maybe maturing and growing in faith gives us the opportunity to understand a little more of God's wisdom and love in our lives. Maybe that's God's call for how we live out each day to multiply examples of God's wisdom so that we can build communities, connections with people where we can work together and mentor one another so that all of us are growing in wisdom and doing a better job of loving God and loving our neighbors, in part because we've done the work of loving ourselves. We've each been given this amazing life, and what we choose to do with it matters a lot. Of course, we can get stuck in a mode where we're kind of self-absorbed and self-contained, and we lose track of our connections in community. When that happens, we can get stuck, and our lives become stagnant. But the Spirit is always present, pushing us and calling us to re-engage, to pay attention to the choices that we're making and the wisdom that we're living into so that we can grow and mature into people who live in great beauty and who experience faithful maturity. All that to say, I really don't think God is a divine killjoy. The rules are there to give us parameters so that we can experience life in the best ways we can. God wants us to love ourselves in the same way that God loves each one of us so that you can join God in the one self-giving love that upholds you and all of creation. And if we can trust ourselves in that love, we can become the best selves that we can be. We can thrive. We can live fully, experience deep joy and know wholeness. That's the kind of love we're striving after. That's the kind of love that God wants for us. And it's one of the reasons it's so important to be walking this road of faith together 
so that we can remind each other, so that we can call one another back to community and to self. We journey even deeper and into this beautiful mystery of the Spirit's love. That's when we know God's presence, and that's when we experience our neighbor, and that's where we know and love ourselves. Hear these words from the book of James. Who is wise and knowledgeable among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. If you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be arrogant and lie about the truth. That is not wisdom that comes down from above but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, willing to yield full of mercy and good fruits without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This week, let us strive together to love God, to love others, and to love ourselves as we grow in wisdom and in faith. Amen. A few things to be thinking about this week. So we continue comp contemplating uh, the words from Proverbs chapter 4. I want you to think about how a rule or a wise saying or a mentor have helped you as you've lived out your life. Question number two, I think, is a bit of a challenge. How do you respond to the idea that if we love ourselves, we'll practice self-examination, self-control, self-development, self-care, and self-giving rather than self-indulgence? Love for you to find a partner this week and have a private conversation about how you're doing in all of those areas of self-examination. Listen to each other well in the conversation and then pray for each other. And number four, as you spend time daily in prayer this week, I want you to think about those people who love you the most in your lives and imagine standing with them as they see you and as they love you in silence and in God's presence, find ways to hold yourself in that kind of love. In addition to things to think about and pray about, I always like to give you challenges for ways that you can begin to take action as you live out your faith. We're in the midst of a back-to-school fair, acknowledging that we have many families in our neighborhood and in our community who can't afford all that is required for school supplies in the fall. So on your way out uh, near the main entrance, there are tags in the mission center. You're welcome to grab a tag, purchase the items on the tag, and then leave them in the mission bins that are there. Uh, those get sent out to a central place where kids are uh, given all of the things that they need. I'd also love for you to consider uh, being here on Sunday, August 7th. We're having free lunch and a workshop that day on leaving a legacy. We'll be talking about wills and charitable gifts. We'll be talking about all of the different ways that you can give to the church uh, and the tax benefits and some of the investment opportunities. Reverend Jason Menke from the Wisconsin United Methodist Foundation will be coming to teach us and to answer any questions. And it's free lunch. If you want more information, there are some uh, more pieces of info on the slides that are scrolling. There's also information um, on the bulletin board in the hallway, and you can sign up in the church office. If you're going to be there, let us know so we can make sure to have enough food for you. As we come to a time of offering today, we know that it's another way that we take action as we live out our faith. As we give, it is in continued conversation with God. 
how God is calling us to give and live and serve in each part of our lives. So we give, trusting that God walks with us, that God informs us, and God gives us the ability to open up our lives. A loose coin offering this month is going to Zoe Empowers, which is an organization that helps orphans in Africa and India who are preparing to age out of the system and launch into the world that gives startup grants to them so that they have money to begin to create a beautiful adult life. Again, all of our loose coin offerings will be going to that ministry. Uh, your gifts can go in the envelopes that were in your bulletins today. If you're worshiping online, you're welcome to give online at abumc.org, or uh, you can give any gifts uh, by mailing them to the church office. Thank you for all of the ways that you give and serve in the life of the church and in the community of which you are a part. Let's lift up our voices in praise and thanksgiving as we sing our closing song, Wonderful Words of Life.
as we leave this place and go back out into the world, receive these words of blessing with God's deep love in our hearts. God, go with us. With God's wisdom to know and to understand, God, go with us. With God's spirit stirring in our souls, God, go with us. And with God's power of compassion and love, God, go with us into the world and into each new day. Amen.